Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell, and I'm one of the pastors here. I wanted to share some announcements with you this morning. Tonight at 6 o'clock from 6 to 7.15, our youth will be meeting in the building. Mask and social distancing are required, but it was a great time Sunday night when we started back up. We had a fabulous group, and if you have a youth in your family, we hope that you'll plan on having them here. And you may not know, if you had a, somebody in your family enter the sixth grade this year, they are eligible for youth. Contact me for more information or just come to the church on Sunday nights at six, and we'd love to have our new sixth graders as a part of the group. On Wednesday nights, children are meeting, also with masking and social distancing. They meet from 6 to 7.15 Wednesday nights in the Activity Center, and it's a great opportunity for our children to be together. I hope if you have children, they'll be able to come. Our charge conference is November 13th at 7 p.m. That's the official meeting of the year where we review the year with our district superintendent. If you're on the church council or if you chair a committee in the church or a work area, uh, you are invited to be at charge conference. It is on Zoom. Call the office if you need more information or check the newsletter. Uh, then on the 28th, we'll be having neighborhood breakfast uh, we've done one of those now outdoors where we simply uh, hand out a sack meal to people and it was greatly appreciated. That will happen again on November 28th. Uh, the breakfast starts at 9. If you'd like to volunteer, contact Sarah Riddle or the church office and uh, we'll get you set up to be a volunteer for Neighborhood Breakfast. Today we continue our sermon series on resilience. What does it mean to be resilient at a time like this? I think it's going to be very, very meaningful to all of us. Thank you for worshiping with us today at Centenary. Good morning. Good morning. I even gave you a countdown. Let's try it again. Here we go. Ready? Ready? Are you ready? I want you to bring it from down here. For some of us, it, it's, I have to take a lot of energy to move it from my down here, but I know you can do it. Ready? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's wonderful. And welcome to all of you who are watching online today. We're so glad that all of you are with us at Centenary United Methodist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. We're so glad to be worshiping together. Thanks to all of you who are here in the sanctuary for following all the safety precautions. We appreciate that so very, very much. You've been so faithful in that. You know, the day is coming, I truly believe, when we'll be able to set these things down. We'll be able to take all these annoying signs off the doors of the churches that tell you all the things you have to do to go to worship and be in church, and that's going to be a glorious day. But until that day, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your commitment to be here. And I know many of you have to watch from home because of a of your health issues, and we love you and we appreciate your faithfulness as well. Uh, we're doing offering different, of course, because of COVID. There are baskets on the way out, containers, where you can leave your offering. And also, if you've not turned in your pledge card yet, please do so. That will be very helpful to the life of the church and an important step in your spiritual life as well. You know, in the United Methodist Church, we believe that Christ is present when we worship. So when we walk in this room, we're in the very presence of Jesus Christ, who loves us and adores us. Welcome to all of you. We're so glad you're here. Now let us worship in the presence of Jesus. I am Nathan Skinner, your liturgist today. Let's go ahead and stand for the call to worship. And I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation. 
tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palms in their hands. And they cried out with loud voice. Victory belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And angels fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of praise, All Creatures of Our God and King, found on page 62 in the United Methodist <laughs> Hymnal, or the words can be found on the screen. Thank you. We're very close to Veterans Day, and uh, I'll be talking about that a bit in the sermon today, but we also wanted to take a moment and ask all of you who are currently serving in the military or who have served in the military, would you please stand at this time? We just want to show our appreciation to you. Thank you very much for your service. We're very, very proud of you and proud to know you. Join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Would you please stand? And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
us pray. Almighty God, in the Gospels, you tell us about soldiers, how essential they are, how, because they hold life itself in their hands, they are called to live by the highest standards. Today, Lord, we pray for our service people, men and women all over the world. We pray along with them that the day will come when their jobs are no longer necessary. We long for that day when the world knows true peace, when violence and conflict are no more. But until that day, Lord, we pray that we pray that you lift up men and women who will defend what is right, who will protect the vulnerable, who will stand above and hold themselves to the highest standards. We pray that you give them wisdom and discernment that they might do their jobs in the very best ways and in the safest ways. We pray for their protection. We pray that you watch over them and keep them safe. We pray for their husbands and their wives, their children and their families, that they might be comforted with your divine presence, that even in the midst of conflict, they will know that you are walking with them. And this day, as we think about an election, we pray for peace in our own nation. We pray that we will overcome conflict and the divisions that have separated us that we will once again begin to think of ourselves as Americans, not as blue or red. Help us, O oh God, as we begin another chapter in our history as a country, to never forget those who are weak and vulnerable and those who need us the most. Let us not be judged by our wealth or our power, but by our kindness and our compassion to those who are the weakest and those who are the most frail. We pray, O oh Lord, that on this day, your word will speak to us in a powerful way, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in this worship service, that our hearts might be like open doors to receive you. These things we ask in the name of the Savior Christ, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. This last month, We closed the nursery during COVID, and we haven't had a lot of our babies here. And it is a beautiful thing. That is the sound of worship. That's the sound of the church gathered together. You just let him sing out. We're glad to have him. This last month, we had an opportunity to resume one of our longstanding ministries at Centenary. We've had to shut down our neighborhood breakfast since the COVID pandemic began, but in October, we were able to do a to-go breakfast. On October 24th, we served breakfast outside in to-go bags to about 45 guests who came by the church, and we were able to take uh, about 60 bags to different ministries around the area to share. Right around this church, there are people in need, and I'm so happy that we get to reach out and connect with them. Some people that don't join us for worship services or other, other ministries, but come and eat breakfast with us. We're happy to make that connection with them again. We're very happy that this ministry is continuing, and we thank you for your support. It's your giving that makes this ministry possible. It's also the giving of time for our volunteers who came uh, on a Friday afternoon to pack bags on a Saturday morning to heat up sausage biscuits and pancake and sausage on a stick and who stood out in the cold to give away these bags. We'll be continuing in November with another to-go neighborhood breakfast. It will be on November the 28th at nine o'clock in the morning. We'll also be preparing uh, meals on Friday afternoon, the 27th, about two o'clock. If you want to come by and help, please let Sarah Riddle know if you're interested or want more information or you can contact the office. We're happy that this ministry is continuing, even though it looks a little different now, we're continuing to do ministry in Lawton during the pandemic. Thank you.
it's now time for God to receive our gifts and offerings. Let's go to him in prayer. Ever vigilant God, you watch over us every night as we sleep and every day as we rise to do our work. And as we gather at tables to feast on the food you provide, your care for us is never ceasing. We long to be as vigilant as we strive to be the kingdom ready church you desire here on earth. Help us to keep our eyes and ears open to the needs around us. May we give so generously that when it is time to close our eyes and sleep, we will rest knowing we have been faithful and vigilant in our caring and compassion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 20 through 22. Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as my, I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. The days before COVID, you may not be able to remember this, but things were different, right? So when a new preacher went to a new church, he or she would go out and start to visit people. I love a story about a a pastor that went to a new church, and he went out and just took the church membership role and started calling on people. And he was very well received as he went home to home to home. But he got to one house, and he could tell there was movement inside, but nobody would come to the door. Finally, he squiggled and wiggled through the rose bushes, got right in there and tapped on the window. He could see a shadow dart by, and he said, it's me, it's your new preacher. I just want to talk to you and say hello. But nobody came to the door. So finally, in frustration, he took out his business card, and he wrote down a verse from the passage that Nathan had just, has just read for us, and he left it in the person's door. It said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Next Sunday... They took up the offering, and his, his little business card came back. One of the counters handed it to him after the church. Sure enough, there on the front was the verse he had written, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And on the back, someone had written Genesis 3.10. I heard your voice from the garden, but I was naked and hid myself. <laughs> right? We know this passage. We've heard it all of our lives. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We've heard that all of our lives. Most people don't realize it comes from the book of Revelation. It's a powerful and strong image, this image of Christ at the door. Amos Wilder, who was a a brilliant preacher and poet, born in 1895, writes a poem about a wounded veteran who comes home at the end of the war. He's walking down the street and people are celebrating that the war has ended. He sees a beautiful home. Everything about it is glorious and magnificent. He can see through the windows the people are dressed in the finest clothes and celebrating. They have the nicest china. They're serving beautiful, exotic foods. And he goes to the door thinking, well, I'm a veteran. This is what it's about, isn't it? But then he stops and realizes he wouldn't be welcome there. And as we step back from Wilder's poem, we realize it is the Christ who once again has come to a door and has been left on the outside. Doors are powerful symbols. And Prudy and I, when we travel and take Christian groups around the world, I, I always take pictures of doors. I'm just sort of fascinated with them, how different they look in different parts of the world and yet how interesting and inspiring they can be. Doors can keep us out, right? When the doors are locked, we're not allowed inside. We're separated. We're not welcome. But doors can also be amazing. When you go to the door of a friend or family member who loves you, and the door swings open and they welcome you, that's one of the greatest feelings in the world. That's why I think the Lord used this image in this passage. Now you remember, and maybe some of you weren't here before, so we'll we'll review a little. We're in a series called Resilience. It was inspired by a book I read when I was having a little struggle in my spiritual life. Friends gave me a book called Resilience by a man named Gaither who was a, a Navy SEAL. And he was trying to help one of his comrades who was also a SEAL who was having post-traumatic stress disorder. And he has this wonderful book in which he he shares all kinds of great stuff. But in particular, the bottom line is he says, you know, most of life is just about hanging in there. We get beaten, we, 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 we rise up, 
we are successful, we fail again, and we rise again. That's very powerful to me. You know, the, the author of Revelation was saying the same thing. John was a preacher, a Christian preacher, at a time when the church was being persecuted, right after the time of Jesus, when emperors like Nero were imprisoning and, and killing Christians openly and publicly. Peter had been put to death. St. Paul had been put to death. These great Christian leaders were being martyred and put to death as Rome was seeking to, to wipe out this new uprising, this new faith. And so John was one of those leaders. He gets shipped off to the island of Patmos. If you go there today, you'll pay a lot of money because there are a lot of nice resorts there in the Aegean. But in those days, it was a gulag. It was like a concentration camp where you sent the political dissidents, people who you didn't agree with. Imagine thoughts like that. He gets shipped off there. He wants to write back to his church and to his fellow Christians and encourage them and affirm them because he's had a vision from Christ, a revelation. And he wants to share and, and encourage his fellow Christians to hang in there, to be resilient. And so he writes in this coded language. We sometimes struggle with it, but the Christians who would have received John's messages, they would have understood it because it's, it's based on Old Testament imagery, particularly from the book of Daniel, this sort of wild, very vibrant imagery. And he could code things, 666, which was representative of a Roman legion, the great Satan, which was Nero or Domitian, whoever was the, the emperor at that time, that language would mean something to the Christians who were receiving John's messages. And he hoped that by coding it that way, he could slip it past the Roman guards and past the Roman authorities, and it would go eventually to Christians and encourage them. You may also remember that, that as he starts this sort of thing, starts this messaging procedure and this process, this undercover communications, that he addresses part of this to seven churches in Asia. And he gives advice to each of those. And today we're on the last church, sort of save the, the, the most important, I think, in a way for last. Laodicea to me is the most American church. It's most like American Christians because they were very comfortable in their faith. They thought, as long as I'm okay, then I don't need to worry about anything else. Laodicea is a very interesting place. It's in western Turkey, uh, if you're trying to think about where it might be in the, in the map today. Laodicea was a, a powerful city. It was the administrative center of, of a Roman province. So they ruled over 34 other pretty big, significant cities. They were the center of control. They were the center of the wool industry. If you got wool anywhere in the, Roman, in the Roman Empire, it came through Laodicea. They were incredibly wealthy. When an earthquake struck their city and devastated it, damaged every single building, Nero sent wagons of gold to help them rebuild because the city was very important to him. It was situated right on the main trade route to Rome. He wanted it to thrive and be successful. When the wagons got to the border of Laodicea, the city officials came out and told them, Go back to Rome. We don't need your money. We've got plenty of money. We can take care of this. Yeah, pretty amazing, right? They also were the medical center of the Roman Empire. It's where you went to be trained as a doctor. And in fact, there was a new science that was just being developed in the city of Laodicea called ophthalmology. That's right. The world's leading authority on eye ailments was in Laodicea, and people came from all over the world to go to Laodicea for their eyes to be healed and for medical treatment and to study medicine. They were incredibly important, wealthy, and successful. They had one problem. I guess every city has its problem, and they had a problem. Their problem was water. The nearby city of Hierapolis had hot springs they were known for. People would go, tourists would go to enjoy the hot springs, and the water there was vibrant and alive and bubbling up out of the sides of the mountains. And the other city that was nearby, Colossae, from which we get letters to the Colossians, those letters in the Bible, Colossae had ice-cold springs pouring out of the mountains there, and so the water there was refreshing and wonderful, but not Laodicea. They had to bring their water in via aqueduct, which is sort of a big open structure. It would travel across that hot Mediterranean land, and it would evaporate, it would get tepid, which is not very good, 
and, and animals were in it, all kinds of things happened to it. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it, it was dirty and filthy and nasty and hard to drink. And it was very common for the people there to drink the water and then to become sick. So that was their struggle. That's what they struggled with. Other than that, they felt like they had a great life and everything that they had was in their favor. Sort of like we feel sometimes. We think our life is perfect and in order and we're, we're in control. And then something comes along and shakes us up. In this case, the world around them is crumbling. There's incredible political unrest. Rome is going through a series of emperors that will ev eventually lead to the demise of the entire empire. Christians, their fellow Christians, are being imprisoned and even killed. Christians in Jerusalem are starving to death. None of this matters to the Christians in the Laodicean church. They're managing to ignore all of that and think only of themselves. Now, you remember how the book starts again, Revelation starts. It starts with various angels being dispersed to these churches to take a message to them. It's John, that's what John sees, Jesus sending the angels to do that. The Jewish people believed that there were guardian angels for every church, every house of worship, every nation, and every person. If you believe like our Jewish friends believe, then I think that the guardian angels for our country have been working overtime and I pray that they will continue to minister to the healing of our nation. They believe that. And they were, these Christians were Jewish converts. They were the original Jewish people who had been hauled off into slavery in Babylon. When they finally were released, they had come back and settled in this part of Turkey. And so they had that locked in their hearts, that belief. And so John tells us that these angels are going to carry these messages. They're going to make sure that these messages get through to the churches. And so he puts his faith, his power, and pours his heart into writing to these churches to encourage them. And he writes to Laodicea, and he shares the vision that Christ has given him about their church. And he tells them that Jesus is saying to their church, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I spit you out. Now that's the polite American English translation, what Jesus literally says is, you make me want to vomit, right? I, I would be sad if I was confronted by Jesus, and that's what he said about my life and ministry. You remember there were cities there that had powerful hot water, cities that had ice cold water. Laodicea had water that was sick and worthless and made you sick, and Jesus said, that's what your ministry is like. Because you're not seeing the needs around you. The brokenness, the vulnerability, the hurting. And in fact, Jesus says, you are a people of medicine, but you don't realize that you yourselves are sick. Sick with a disease that is destroying you from the inside out. Your lack of connection with the kingdom and what's important in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Your, your, your inability to see the hurts and the needs around you and to even deal with your own pain. Because what Jesus knows is that all of this sense in the Laodicean church, that we're okay, everything's okay, the rest of the world may be crumbling, but we're fine, is a facade. That literally, they are diseased from within and dying spiritually. Jesus says to them, you need to take ointment. This, these are the people that make eye ointment. He says, you need to take ointment and cleanse your eyes. When you heard Linda singing that song a few moments, listen with your eyes, that's the heart of it. You need to open your eyes. You need to take a medicine. You think your eyes are well? They're not. They're sick. You're not seeing the world as it is, the Christ says. And I have to ask myself, am I seeing the world as it is? Am I seeing the world through the eyes of Christ right? And I have to ask myself that every day in many situations. Are you seeing the world through the eyes of Christ? If not, take the medication. Allow Christ to minister to your life so that you can see the world that way. And then Jesus says, I want to refine you like gold. And I shared with you my, my roommate from college was a jewelry maker, a beautiful jewelry maker. And I noticed that he would take metal 
And he would take scraps, things that people were throwing away, and he would melt it down. And sometimes the metal would be malleable. He could move it, he could form it, he could shape it, and he could make it into something incredible and beautiful. He could refine it and make it new. Other times, the the metal refused to be shaped, and it was thrown in the trash. And Jesus is saying, do you see? I want to take you in the refiner's fire, the pain, the brokenness, the hurt of the world. Then I want to mold you and shape you into something even greater and more beautiful, something real, something that lasts. Which you can only become if you open your eyes and see. Become aware of what's going on in the world and the hurt and the vulnerable people that need your help. If you can only open your eyes and look at your own life and see that you utterly and totally must depend upon Christ. And in the end, we're like that metal in the fire, the gold that Jesus talks about. Will we allow ourselves to be shaped and formed by Christ? Shaped and formed into what God wants us to be or will we refuse? Oh, we'll still be shiny on the outside, but we'll be of no use to anyone and fit only for the trash. And then Jesus begins to talk about a door. I can remember being a a young Christian just out of seminary. I was a pastor and I went to my first church. I was in charge of evangelism. The evangelism program was we would go out on the streets at night and knock on strangers' doors and say, if you died tonight, would you be saved? Right? Right? And that felt uncomfortable to me. It felt thin. It felt weird to say something so profound to somebody and then just walk away and never see them again. That's not evangelism. That's not what's being said in this text. This is something deeper and more more profound. This is about engaging with people in a way that you get to know them, that you stand by them, that you walk with them through the journey of life, that when they fall down, you're there to pick them up, and when you fall down, you allow yourself to be picked up and dusted off. You cry out to your brothers and sisters in the faith when you need help. That's what this is about. You remember I was talking about Amos Wilder. He's one of the most profound uh, people I, I've ever studied, uh, a guy who, who really shapes my life. He was an amazing, incredible man. And it was Amos Wilder who gives us the real understanding, I think, of what Jesus is saying when he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Amos Wilder had this amazing life. He was the son of the United States diplomat to China. His mother came from one of the wealthiest families in the world. In every way, he was set up to be a success in life. He graduated from Yale. He graduated from Oxford. He graduated with his Ph.D. in New Testament studies from Harvard and became the leading New Testament scholar of his day. In fact, the way he taught us to look at the New Testament is what we use every Sunday in this church and in churches all across the globe. He brought together art and theology. He was a profound and powerful poet in his day. He had a little brother that was pretty good too, Thornton Wilder. You might have heard of him. Particularly if you've ever read Our Town or seen the play, right? Thornton Wilder was his little brother. Thornton Wilder won the Pulitzer Prize not once, not twice, but three times. And yet Amos Wilder was a man that could stand on his own. He had this life that in every way seemed perfect. He seemed like everything he he, he did was, was the right step. And there was no reason for him to vary from that life in any way. No reason for him to change the path that his family had set him on to be one of the greatest speakers, leaders, and writers of his age, which he would become. But not before he opened a door. His country, the United States, went to war. And back in those days, there wasn't much of a medical corps. Most of the people who were in the medical corps were volunteers. They drove the ambulances. They served as medics. And so Amos, Nevin Wilder, left this gilded, perfect life because he knew he was called to be something more than comfortable. And he volunteered as a medic in World War I. Now, if you've ever read about World War I, you know it was pretty awful. I know that I did research on my granddad's unit, and half of the boys from Oklahoma that went never came back. 
it was that kind of a war, just horrific. All wars are. But that was incredibly bloody and awful. And he was a medic, running from trench to trench, constantly under fire, constantly under bombardment. He served with these, these crazy, wild, amazing characters who were all doing that same sort of work as volunteers, included people like the great composer Maurice Ravel, right? And another young American who was his buddy named Walt Disney. But at one point, Amos Wilder felt like he could do more. He felt like he was being called to stand up to the evil that was there, that he was witnessing every day as young soldiers were bleeding and dying. He left the volunteer corps and enlisted in the Army of the United States. Because of his standing, because of his family, he was immediately offered the opportunity to be an officer. He refused. He said, I want to be a common soldier. Send me where you need me the most. They made him a corporal, and they assigned him to the field artillery. Now you know why I'm telling this story, right? And there he served in the worst days of World War I. As luck would have it, he entered the artillery just as the war was taking its worst turn. He served as an artilleryman, but he also served as an ad hoc medic. And he wrote powerful stories about how he would be in the trenches holding together the bleeding bodies of his comrades in arms and trying to save their lives. It all ended up with him spending a long time in an army hospital trying to recover from the effects of the war. And when it was all over, he wrote one of the most powerful accounts of that war that we have. And in that account, he says, he was there in the trenches, covered in blood, surrounded by the dying I was trying to save, that I finally understood Revelations 3.20. It was there that I finally understood what Jesus was saying. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's not a word of judgment. It's not a word of condemnation. Jesus didn't come down from heaven to send those young, wounded, dying boys to hell. It was Jesus crying out trying to save us, saying to each of us it was time to change, that we couldn't go on living this way anymore. When Jesus then speaks those words to the one who conquers, you will join me on my throne even as I have conquered. Jesus is not talking about a military victory. He's not talking about becoming the most powerful business person in your community or the wealthiest person in your community. He's talking about laying down your life in the trenches with the people around you who are bleeding and dying. To follow Jesus. To open that door. To let Christ into your life. Is to become a person who enters the battle, the brokenness of this world, who runs from trench to trench under bombardment, who may be wounded yourself in order to share the hope that Christ is in the world and that Christ has not left us, but Christ has met us in the very places where we are most broken. Jesus stands at the door and knocks, not to condemn us, but to make us resilient. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We invite you this morning to respond to the presence of Jesus Christ who is in this place. If you've never been baptized, to be baptized, to follow in the footsteps of Christ. If you don't have a church home, to make this your church home, that you might live out your faith in this place. Or to come with any need you have, that we might unite and pray for you. Christ is here with you today, ready to meet you just where you are, to love you and claim you as his own. Will you come as we stand and sing? Sorrow.
you seated for just a moment? We come today, we have two prayer requests for us to unite in prayer. God's word in the book of James says that where we gather together and pray, God hears our prayers and answers our prayers. Ian comes, he has a new family, and they're just starting together, starting a new life together, and he requests our prayers for their family, for this new chapter in their life that will be blessed and that God will be with them. And what a joy it is to make that prayer with you. And I appreciate you so much for stepping forward and asking for that prayer. Bama comes, carrying her husband John's request and hers, that John will receive healing. If you, many of you know John Beckman. He's just had repeated challenges physically this year. And uh, many of you who are watching at home know John. And we want to unite in prayer for his healing, that uh, we can get to a place where, where it's good. So we pray for each of you. Bam, I'm going to ask you to stand with Prudy. Nathan, if you'll come stand with Ian. And we're going to pray. Normally they'd lay hands on you, but I think they'll just stand by you today. Let's pray. Powerful God, almighty God, God of love and mercy, today we lift up these precious prayer concerns. We pray for a family that is beginning. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will pour out an anointing upon them that will bring them a sense of relationship that is powerful and good and strong in which they'll be aware that you are with them and that you're comforting them and guiding them and giving them uh, just a sense of being a family together. And we praise this, this young man who's come forward in today and he is asking, Lord God, for your strength in, in all of that so that what happens in this family, Lord, will be not just a blessing to them but a blessing to you. And so we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon this family. And Lord God, we lift up our brother John, Bama's husband, such a dear part of this congregation, and he's faced so many physical challenges. And Bama, their daughters have been there with him to encourage him and walk with him. Lord God, right now we're asking for a, an extraordinary anointing in his life. It will bring him physical healing. It will also be a comfort to his heart that he and Bama and the girls and the family will all experience your prayer, your presence in a very powerful way. We ask that John can feel better. We ask that John can find it easier to walk and to get around and will be strengthened and that these setbacks will end and he'll begin to see a path forward where there's improvement all the time. We ask these things in the name of our Savior Christ and our great physician, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You know, Christ is here every week, whether you're watching at home or whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're in the contemporary service, Christ is here with us. Ministry gets done, and it is powerful and important ministry. Uh, I was surprised. I was, we we're preparing for our charge conference, which is our year-end report. that We turned in the district superintendent, Nathan, our friend here. And uh, I was surprised at all the things we've still accomplished this year even in the face of COVID. It's amazing. We soon will have fed 2,500 street people through uh, the youth and through the uh, ministry that our folks do through St. John's here. That's amazing. During COVID, our neighbors who are hungry, walking up, knocking on this door of this church and on the places of health in this community that are hungry, they don't have food to eat, and you fed them. That's incredible and amazing. We're doing children's ministry, youth ministry. We've had baptisms. We've had lots of people join. We've been there for people in the hospital. We've been there for people who are dying. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Will you stand now and join me in the singing chord? Go in strength to be the saints of God, for you will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike you, nor any scorching heat. God will guide you to the spring of life and wipe away every tear from your eyes. Amen. 